Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar brought to you by CodeFresh Live. Today, we present to you Helm 3, Navigating to Distant Shores. Uh, this session is being recorded, and a link to the recording will be sent to you by the end of the week, so don't worry. And we'll be taking questions throughout the session, but please submit them using the Q&A button on your Zoom toolbar. So you'll see on the bottom you have chat available to you. Please feel free to talk to us in the chat, but if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, section so we make sure and keep track of them, and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Lastly, please remember to check out all of our upcoming events on, at codefresh.io uh, slash events. Uh, we have fresh and informative webinars for you several times a month. So our presenter today is Jessica Dean. She's a senior cloud advocate for Microsoft Azure, and she is fresh off her trip from Helm Summit in Amsterdam, and she's going to share with you what she learned about Helm 3, tips for a successful rollout, how to upgrade your charts, and more. Um, so, and she'll be joined by Dan Garfield, our Chief Technology Evangelist at CodeFresh, later on for the Q&A. Uh, so that's it for the housekeeping items. With that, I'll go ahead and, and hand it over to Jessica, if you'll join us. Hello! Yay, I'm on camera. It's funny because I can look this way at the camera, but then I look this way and that's where my face is. Anyway. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I'm very excited to talk to everyone about Helm 3 and some of the big changes, uh, some of the breaking changes, and some general things to be aware of as you plan your migration from Helm 2 to Helm 3. So we're going to go ahead and dive right in, make sure that I can click here. There we go. So we have an outline of things that we're going to cover over an hour or so, including a demo where you're going to see all of this live. So really, this is more spoilers than an outline. First off, we're going to kind of go over why Helm. Why do we care about Helm? Why was there a need for Helm? Uh, if you're relatively new to the Helm community, we want to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So we want to kind of have that refresher at the very beginning. And then we're going to dive into the version 3 overview. Uh, some of the concepts that were discussed, some of the feedback that we heard and was considered by the Helm team. Uh, and then we're going to dive right into the meat and potatoes, breaking changes, new features. We're going to play with it. And of course, we'll talk about what's next. So first off, again, if you're new, Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. I would argue it is the de facto package manager for Kubernetes. You can define your deployments when it comes down to Kubernetes orchestration uh, using other tools, maybe things like Customize, um, but it can get very challenging to get started. Uh, and that was one of the reasons behind Helm. Uh, people kind of forget that Kubernetes itself is, is a little over five years old, right? I think in May is when they just celebrated its fifth year anniversary. And Helm is almost as old as Kubernetes. It originally came out of a hackathon by a company called Deus about four years ago. And it was designed to be an on-ramp to Kubernetes. Uh, it was designed to help make the simpler, which was Kubernetes intention, uh, since Kubernetes was designed to automate deployment, scaling, and management of applications. Helm was designed to make that simpler. But the Helm 2 that you're using today is actually a merger of Google's code base and Deus's code base. So Helm 1 was Deus, and then Helm 2 was the merger. So not only was there a lot of things that were being bolted on after the fact for Kubernetes, since it is almost as old, it predates RBAC, it predates CRDs, but it's also a merger of two different uh, companies' code, so to speak. So that was something that we really had to consider as we move forward. We know that containers solve problems, right? We want to simplify the age old issue of it works on my machine. It's now the IT person or operations engineers job to figure it out. And containers kind of takes a lot of that out of the consideration. Now we can have something that's more consistent and more repeatable, but that doesn't mean it made it necessarily easier because for all the problems it solve, solves or solved, it does not solve all problems. Now you have a whole other world or plethora of issues that you have to be aware of. And so that was where Helm came in, was to try to offer variables or templates, i.e. a template engine, to help you define your Kubernetes manifests. 
Uh, previously, you would have your, your YAML file and you would never know if tabs or spaces got messed up. You try to override your values for your entries, either maybe your image repository, your image tag, your replicas, whatever variable or whatever hard-coded value you wanted, you'd have to find a way to replace that. And Helm made that significantly easier. And that was really, again, one of the considerations that was uh, really at the forefront of all the core maintainers minds when we were also thinking about how to promote or pr approach Helm 3. We knew that containers needed orchestrating, but we knew that the way that maybe Helm 2 addressed it could be better. It could be improved. And so again, if you just remember the definition of Kubernetes, we wanted to simplify the simple. We wanted to simplify the automation, simplify how you would handle deploying, make it easier to scale, and make it easier to handle operating application management. But not only did we want to focus on simplicity, the team really wanted to focus on security. So security is going to be a big part to this as well. Uh, I love this particular slide because it's entirely accurate. Uh, we replaced all of our monolith. Mo we replaced all of our monolith with microservices, so that every outage could be more like a murder mystery. Right now, we turned it into a giant clue game, but that's not helpful. So, as humorous as this is, it's also very accurate, and that's where the stage for Helm really kind of came in. For again, for anyone who's new to Helm, might have been hearing about Helm three, wants to understand the four big primary tasks of Helm or objectives was to manage even the most complex workload, to be able to do easy updates, to be able to share your charts or your uh, definition, so, so to speak, and to be able to roll back. Even though that last one, that rollback, I kind of feel is more of a, uh, it's a little bit of a lie, right? You're never gonna fully roll back to a different release. You're just gonna roll back to a different version, but that release you push out is still a new release marker that's moving forward. So just a little bit of a, a tidbit to, to throw in there. But even when you're managing the most complex applications, how are you aligning your security? How are you making sure that security is repeatable? Right now in Helm 2, you have Tiller that manages it. And you either deploy Tiller to the kube system namespace, or you deploy it to individual namespaces, and then you create a cluster role binding, and you probably give it God mode access or admin as access or you have to scope it down to such a ridiculous level that now it makes that complexity management actually more complex, right? And that was kind of the same thing with easy updates. If I'm trying to consider how I'm handling my rolling forward or making updates, and I'm having to figure out where Tiller is, in which namespace, what permissions it has, it became very complicated because now you're trying to manage your permissions essentially from two different tools. And that goes back to also simply sharing. I want to simply share my charts, but what's simple about management of security on two different levels? And same thing with rollbacks. If I'm rolling back to a previous release, what permissions were assigned in that release? What CRDs? What, what did I define? That became a very big consideration. So in Helm 3, we really wanted to not only focus on security, but listen to you. You, the users of Helm 2, the users who have been either maybe with Helm from the very beginning, you remember it from V1 days, uh, maybe you've been using it from V2.0 or 2.0 and then even earlier, or maybe you joined a little bit later, but every single perspective, regardless of where you fit in the spectrum, is valid. And so Helm 3 came out of that perspective. It came out of your feedback and it came out of your best desires for security, for simplicity, for managing that complexity. So it really is a community effort going forward. We really wanted to focus on that dramatic simplification, but there was quite a bit of architectural changes. In fact, as we'll come to see, that it, was, it needed a complete rework of the code. So the biggest way to think of Helm 3 is it's going to be simpler, it's gonna be more secure, and most importantly, aside from being based on community best practices, it's gonna be based on production use cases, things that you're actually doing in production that you wanna consider and take away. So as I mentioned, there was a major refactor that was needed, right? That when you have a merger of two different code bases and you're kind of bolting on support for RBAC and CRDs after the fact, you either kind of sit there and revisit the code or you take it all out and you, you write it 
correctly from the ground up. And so that's really what Helm 3 is, uh, is we really wanted to make sure that if we wrote it from the ground up, we could better support and better address native support for Kubernetes when it comes down to RBAC and CRDs. So we replaced custom APIs for charts and deployments now with secrets. Previously, you would store any of your chart releases, not you, but Helm 2 by default, would store any of the release history in a config map. So not only are you using Helm 2 that's local on the client side, Tiller is the in-server on the cluster side component, and then anything that you're defining here on the client side gets handed over to Tiller, gets rendered over to the Kubernetes API, and then gets stored in a config map. So all of that's kind of changed. You only have the client side now, and your release history and marker now gets stored as a secret object, which really does make it more secure, because now you can tie it over into a secret management systems. If you're using a different secret provider on the back end, now you can be more uh, aware and guaranteed of your secret information itself. As a result, because of the way we handle those changes, it now makes it more Kubernetes native as opposed to just a third party tool that's simplifying things. So now when you're interacting with Helm and Kubernetes, you're no longer going through Tiller, right? That's going to be the big spoiler that at this point everyone already knows. Tiller's gone. So now you're not getting any of your authorization or your security rules from uh, your from Helm and Knit or from anything there, you're not getting it from Tiller or your cluster role binding or your cluster admin, you're getting it directly from your kube config. So this is important, especially as you consider how you're going to tie DevOps into this, which we're going to talk about at the very end. But right now, if you have a pipeline that is part on your build server is doing Helm and Knit and is setting up the service account that you create in the namespace you declare, none of that's going to work anymore. Now you're going to have to actually make sure that your build server or your local system has access to your Kubernetes config and your context. And whatever permissions your build server or your local system has to your cluster, that's all the access Helm has. So now you only manage security from one part of it. So as a result, you're now using native Kubernetes RBAC to limit access to resources as opposed to two different types of security definitions. So of course, big spoiler, Tiller's gone. Uh, and I have the next slide is going to be a simpler version of this. As we've talked about, we wanted to make a more flexible architecture. We wanted to make the entire concept of using Helm a lot more simpler, a lot more secure, and to make upgrades simpler and secure. So you now use the Kubernetes API directly. You render charts client side and it stores in the release. It stores in the secret and we'll take a look at that. And as a result, not only does this make it easier for all of the users, if you want to be a contributor, if you want to be part of this very wonderful community project, it now lowers the barrier of entry for contributors as well. So the key takeaways from what has changed and what has kind of improved in Helm 3 is there's no more need to have any kind of cluster admin privileges or to install Tiller into every namespace, right? Because now you're going to get your permissions directly from Kubernetes, from Kubernetes RBAC. And anything that is defined in your local Kubernetes config file, that's what's going to be what Helm uses. That's it. That's the biggest security takeaway to kind of focus on when it comes to Helm 3. Now, let's also talk about some certain things that changed. Now, this is not a breaking change, okay? These commands on the left, Helm delete, Helm inspect, Helm fetch, all still work, but they are now aliases for commands that we really wanted to make more native, more uh, relative to this kind of space that we're in when it comes to containers and orchestration. Helm delete now becomes Helm uninstall. Helm inspect now becomes Helm show, and Helm fetch now becomes Helm pull. You can think of it because we have Helm repositories. And then if you think on the other hand for a Docker repository, both instances in Docker, I'm gonna do a Docker pull to get my image. Now I can do the same thing for my chart. The other thing is the purged flag. So previously when you had a release and you would do Helm delete the name of the release, it's still gonna keep any of the history, right? And then that could cause issues moving forward. You'd have to be explicit in saying that you wanna purge and fully remove the history. Now, by default, the Helm uninstall command is going to remove the history unless you add in the dash dash keep history flag. 
So you have the ability to still keep it and to keep the old behavior, but now it has to be something that you declare that you're intentional about. Now let's talk about certain breaking changes. This is important because when it comes down to a complete refactor and changing of code, uh, things sometimes are going to break. And let's go ahead and talk about what that means. For one, I told you that Helm init doesn't work anymore. There's no need to initialize your Helm instance and set up a service account and do all of that magic. That was the purpose of Helm init before was to set up local config directories, paths, uh, create all this stuff locally. It's been removed because there's now no need for it. So now your config directories and your repositories where Helm used to live, which used to be your home directory slash dot Helm, and then you have all your different subfolders, uh, unless you of course overrode that, but that was the default. That's now no longer, that's also changing. Uh, so if the directory is not present, we'll create the directories for you, but the directory paths and the specifications have also changed. The entire purpose of Helm 3, aside from making it simpler and making it more secure, was also to make it more in alignment and more consistent, more in alignment with other projects and more consistent with how those projects handle paths and directory uh, and storage information, configuration information. So we know that the Helm home directory used to be used. Whatever your user's home folder is, you'd have a hidden folder for .helm. But Helm now is gonna store all of that data based on something that's called XDG specification. There's a link on the Helm blog where you can actually go read up about the full specification, but I'm gonna highlight some of it here. So if you're focusing on XDG, just base directory specification, and you will see this if you type in Helm and dash dash help, you're gonna get the full output of this information. But essentially now you have single base directories and they're gonna use universal variables. Your data files are going to be stored in XDG data home. Your configuration files, XDG config home. Uh, user specific, non essential information, so your cached information, is going to be XDG cache home. And anything that's specific to runtime will be XDG runtime directory. So now everything is going to be just, again, based off of those specified and consistent environment variables. You're going to have the same thing aside from data directory, but even preference directory. So anything relating to your uh, base directories relative to which data should be searched is now going to be referenced by the XDG data directory. Uh, your set of preferences is going to be stored in XDG config DIRs or directories. So let's take a look at that output. You'll see here, this is when I just do helm dash dash help, it actually tells me all of that configuration. It tells me the environment variables that are used. I can even have helm driver to choose the storage driver. That's for my config map, my secret, my memory. I have my data home, my config home, my cache home. But more importantly, I can now see the cache path, the config path, and the data path. And what I love about this output is it also addresses all three operating systems because Helm is cross-platform, but initially a lot of times containers started to focus right on Linux containers, right? But now because Windows is now becoming a lot more prominent and Windows containers is now a thing, now it's also conf uh, configuring data directories to make sure that Windows is also more native. So depending on what operating system you're using, that's gonna be where your cache path, your configuration path, and your data path is now located. And that's gonna be valuable to know so that you can make backups accordingly uh, if you wanna be able to roll out updates or take your data that's stored there when you migrate over to a new system. Personally, I always love knowing where my local data is stored, so I thought this would be valuable. Now, another breaking change or new addition is that JSON schemas can now be imposed on chart values and you can bundle your JSON schemas directly with the chart. You can also use JSON directly for validating chart values. So previously you did everything in YAML. Now there's additional support for JSON as well. Uh, that was to me also really valuable depending on how much you enjoy writing JSON. Uh, and then one of the big changes is stable repo. So by default now, you don't have any repositories with Helm 3. You are gonna have to add your repositories manually. You have to add stable, you'd have to add incubator if you were using charts from those repositories. And of course, you still have to add your own repositories when you set it up. But one other big change that's happening with Helm 3 
is that throughout the life of Helm 3, the stable repository will ultimately be deprecated. It will no, become ultimately no more because, because of the way Helm 3 is really focusing on that community best practice, we're gonna be moving to a more distributed model. So for example, popular charts like Nginx or Jenkins or WordPress, right now those are part of the stable, stable repository. But now you're gonna have those individual companies that will be managing it. And you add uh, repositories from, from those companies when you wanna use those particular charts. So now you can just search using Helm Hub and you'll be able to, to download and install those individual charts. Stable still works right now. So we'll go through and show you how to set it up. But it is something to be aware of throughout the life of Helm 3. There's also namespace changes. And this one is a big one. So previously, if you did a Helm upgrade or Helm install, it would install into whatever namespace by, by default that either you define or it's gonna go into to default. But now Helm is gonna default to a single namespace. So if I say that I wanna install Nginx, which is gonna be one of the examples in our demo, I'm gonna install that to default. And now I'm gonna take Cert Manager, which is a Jetstack Helm chart, and I'm gonna install that to, to Kube System. If I do a Helm LS, or in my demo, it's gonna be H3 because I try to type as little as possible. If I do an H3 LS, I'm only gonna see the chart releases for the namespace I'm running that against. If I wanna see a, a listing of all namespaces, I now have to do dash dash all namespaces. It works very native and very similar to how your kube control or kube cuddle or K, whatever your preferred alias is, I make no judgment, Whatever that is, it's gonna work the same way. If I do K get pods or kube control get pods, that's gonna spit out the pods on whatever namespace I'm running that command against. And Helm is gonna be doing the same thing. And so we create the namespaces, sorry, it's gonna create the resources in the same namespace as the release. Also because of how this gets handled and because of how the information gets stored and how there's also an object change involved, you have to use a plugin to upgrade Helm 2 releases with Helm 3. Uh, the plugin just came out, it's still in beta. I think it came out within the last week. So even this particular plugin part of the demo you're gonna see, I wasn't able to show at Helm Summit. There's a lot of things that are coming out rapidly fast, so I'll have fun to play with them, but it's called Helm 2 to 3. And you'll use that, which is gonna back up all of the releases from your Helm 2 configuration, which was stored in config maps, and it'll actually roll it out over to Helm 3. In fact, I have a screenshot of that. So you're gonna see Helm 2 to 3. You're gonna use the convert uh, functionality, the convert switch. And initially, I recommend using dash dash dry run. I always wanna see what's going to be done before I commit to it. Maybe I have commitment issues, who knows? But I think that that is a best practice. So in this particular example, I took Crack Hunter. If you're already familiar with me or you've seen some of my other webinars with CodeFresh, I've used Crack Hunter a lot. But this particular crock hunter that I was updating was one I hadn't touched since May. It was over 180 days old. It was very much a Helm 2 chart. It was very much a Helm 2 release. It's probably Helm 2.12, if I'm remembering correctly or going back enough months. And the plugin works flawlessly. It goes back and it finds all of my different release history. And it says, this is what's gonna be created for Helm 3. I remove the dry run flag and say, okay, go ahead and convert. The best part is it doesn't delete anything for Helm 2. I can make it do that with another flag, but it's gonna leave my Helm 2 release history and it's gonna create my Helm 3 uh, new history. So I can make sure that Helm 3 is working before I commit to deleting anything with Helm 2. So we'll go through and kind of show how to do that. Uh, the other thing, as I told you, is release information is now stored server side as a secrets object. So we'll take a look at what that looks like as well. This is an example of Nginx. We deployed an Nginx release, I updated it three times, and I see those uh, release markers marked by V1, V2, V3, so on and so forth. I see that in the secret information. The command I ran to get that was kube control, K, kube cuddle, whatever, get secrets. Now chart dependency management has also changed. The old style, if you had a dependency, you would use a requirements YAML and a requirements lock that's now moving to chart YAML and chart lock. So for example, take WordPress. WordPress needs MySQL. So 
by default in the previous version of Helm 2, you would define that dependency in your requirements where I would have MariaDB and the version of whatever chart or release. That would now move over to your chart YAML where you're gonna keep track of that. So if you use any kind of Helm dependency subcommands, be aware that that might cause you a breaking change and you should test that in production before you just migrate right over. Now there's also a new API version of charts available. Previously in your chart.yaml, you didn't have to specify API version. It was just V1. We had never had any kind of uh, incremental change. But now the new API version moving forward for Helm 3 is gonna be API version V2. Uh, and it contains several changes. We talked about the requirements in the chart YAML, but one of the other changes is a CRD directory will now be added to charts for the placement of CRDs. And the way CRDs are handled, uh, you're more than welcome, if you, if you have questions about CRDs or about how this decision was made, please reach out to me online at JLDean, on Twitter, Instagram, GitHub, whatever, whatever's convenient for you. But I'll put you in touch with some of the maintainers who can answer your specific questions. I, I say that because this was a very, very long conversation. CRDs are gonna be applied to your deployment prior to your templates rendering. So your CRD is gonna happen first and then the templates get applied. Uh, and that's partly because of how CRDs get handled. Uh, and there's, there's a little bit more we can go into, but that's one thing to just be aware of is the CRD directory has now been added for the placement of any CRDs you have. They'll be applied prior to any of your templates. And then let's go ahead and switch. So the other thing is to be aware of, this is another breaking change. The CRD install hook has been removed and will not work for Helm V2 charts. There will be a legacy plugin that will ultimately be released uh, that will support V1 charts with the CRD install hook. So hopefully it won't be too much of a breaking change, but you will have to use a plugin. But as of right now, if you're planning on doing something with CRDs and you have a CRD install hook as part of your current template, you're going to have to wait for that plugin or figure out how you can adjust that to the new way of handling CRDs, CRDs because the install hook has been removed. Along with that, Helm search has also been refactored. So now it's going to have uh, subcommands. So now you can search both local repositories and Helm Hub. So any repositories that you have added, uh, as well as the Helm Hub repository itself. Another change is Helm serve has been removed. So if you used to do chart development, you used to kind of play around with local charts before you pushed it to a private repository or public repository. And one of the ways you would play around with it would be to do Helm serve and set up your own local repository instance. That's been removed partially because of the new direction of moving to a distributed model. So now you could have your, either your own public repo or private repo that you use for testing. I released a blog post yesterday about how you can set up a public repo with uh, Azure Storage. You can also do it with GitHub. You can do it with private accounts. CodeFresh gives you a built-in Helm repo as just part of their platform. So there's so many other ways now that you can serve your Helm charts and test it. The other thing to consider is Helm Serve only really tested things locally. So by moving to something that's more distributed, you move to the bigger concept of it will now work for sure on every machine because now you have something that's globally available as opposed to uh, local and on-prem, so to speak. Helm test also receives some major refactoring. So now it includes the test success hooks behavior, and it's gonna be more in line with other hooks that you're already uh, used to. However, test failure has been removed, honestly, because no one was using it really, or it was just very minimal use. It was lack of use. One other big thing is experimental feature gates are now supported. So what that means is if we wanna release features, you essentially now kind of have feature flags or uh, environment variables that are gonna turn your flags on and off. So as new potential features are added, they're gonna be able to be tested by an environment variable. Here's an example for that. You can now pull and push charts from OCI registries. It is an experimental feature. And if you wanna test using OCI registries, you would just enable that environment variable with Helm experimental OCI one 
And once you set that, you'd be able to use OCI registries. Josh Dolinsky, who also was at Helm Summit, did a full session on OCI. And so I know that his slides are up online. If you want to, again, tag me online, I'll make sure to link over to, to his slides and I'll get it added to my Helm 3 repo so you can learn a little bit more about how to get started with OCI registries. Another thing when it comes down to Helm and installing is previously you would just do Helm upgrade install and the chart path, any kind of values that you needed. If you didn't specify a name, it would give you really fun names like Jumping Panda and Crazy Chicken or whatever the names were. But now you have to explicitly set a name or explicitly tell Helm that you want to generate a name. If you don't provide anything by default, you're going to get an error. So just be aware that you either actually name your release or if you want one of those fun names, make sure that you use the generate name flag. Now let's talk about actual excitement, new features, things that are, that are coming forward. For one, we're iterating on the Helm Chart Repository API. As I did say that OCI is now an experimental feature, that means that we're working on compatibility with OCI standard as well. So now eventually we'll be able to have pluggable auth, be able to have uh, artifact types, and uh, right now you already can host your Helm charts on ACR, which is Azure's Container Registry. So the blog post I mentioned that I wrote yesterday was a public repo using Azure Storage, but by default, if you're using Azure Container Registry, since it's a highly available private registry, your Helm charts are also going to be private. That's the same way with CodeFresh. CodeFresh gives you a built-in container registry and a built-in Helm registry, but that's also private as well. But eventually there will be changes to how the Helm chart repository gets handled, uh, how the API gets accessed. And a lot of that is going to be in line with the more distributed mo model of handling Helm charts itself. There will also be library chart support. So this is where you can share it by other charts. It's not going to create any kind of release artifacts of its own, but you can define key elements. Uh, what this means is if I want to say that, hey, every single template, every single chart has to use a pod security policy, I can automatically inject that as part of my charts itself. That's a part of my library collection that I'm going to have defined over every single other chart that also uh, I declare. So that allows now for, easy, for simpler code reuse uh, and simpler security. So if you think back to the four principles of Helm on how it wanted to be more simple, handle complexity, make it easy to share, uh, and then roll back, of course, it hits three of those right here, where we're going to make it easier to share, easier to have security, and easier to define universal rules for your Helm charts. Now we're going to go into the actual demo. Uh, I wanted to make sure we kind of highlighted all of the technical changes, but we're going to play with this right now. So if you want to take a look, I do also have a tutorial online that can be self-guided, so you can use this after the fact. Uh, but we're going to go through some key things right now. So go ahead and go to github.com forward slash jldean helm3 dash demo. If you're watching this and want to just take a picture of the QR code, you can do that as well. Uh, I think this says demo time. So now I'm going to exit from uh, Keynote. I almost said Key Vault, but it's not Key Vault. And we're going to go into First off, we're going to go into the repo. So you're going to see GitHub. This is my repo here. You can see the three different times it's technically been demoed. Helm Summit was more of a tutorial, so the tutorial is available online. Um, I'll zoom in here just a little bit to make sure this is nice and big. In the repo, there's going to be a, quite a few actually helpful, I think, uh, scripts for you. If you don't have a Kubernetes cluster available in a cloud, I wrote a script for AKS. You can get started with Azure with some free credits. I can, if you need access to that, I can give you a link to that. But if you want to get started, I wrote a script that'll install your Kubernetes cluster. I wrote a script that'll help you get start started with Azure storage and a public Helm chart repository. But most importantly, I wrote a script that'll help you get started with Helm 3. So if you click Helm 3, we'll take a look at what's actually happening. Partially because I believe you shouldn't run any script on your system without first understanding what it's going to do to your system. I'm an amazing programmer, but seriously, don't trust me. So if you take a look at line five, I'm setting the Helm version in a variable. I find this to be very helpful because as new beta releases are coming out, I can just change this particular 
variable or a value, and now the script will still work just the same way. In fact, this is the same script I have used since the alpha release back in May. I just keep updating the Helm version. Uh, one other thing that has changed is previously you would download your Helm releases from storage APIs and from a Google container bucket. Now you're going to download it from get.helm.sh get and then whatever that Helm version is. So the next line on line eight is going to be to get the actual, val uh, the actual Helm binary. And then we're going to go ahead and extract it. Now, lines 11 through 13, essentially, is going to see if you've already run the script before. And if so, it's going to make a backup of your temp folder, so it's not going to actually overwrite anything. So that way you don't have to worry about losing any of your information. Line 13 itself is when it's going to move your newly downloaded Helm binary, Helm 3 binary, to a temporary directory. I did this intentionally so it doesn't override you using Helm 2. So one other thing, if you're wondering if you can use Helm 2 and Helm 3 on the same system, the answer is yes. And that's not only the, Helm lo the same local system, it's also the same uh, cloud-based system. So the same uh, Kubernetes cluster, you can also use both Helm 2 and Helm 3 to handle your deployments. And we'll play with that. Uh, so we move that over to a temp folder, and then I'm going to export the Helm home directory just to let Helm know that I don't want to overwrite anything. Even though it changed to the XDG specification, I just wanted to make sure this was more of my own best practice that I didn't overwrite anything whatsoever. There was no potential for that. And then finally, I set a temporary alias to H3, to the Helm 3 binary. Uh, some people call it Helm 3. Like I said, I like typing as little as possible. When I type kube cuddle or kube control commands, I use the letter K. H3 just seemed pretty uh, simple. All of this is being run from a Mac, so and I use ZSH. So the final command is to echo my alias into my ZSH file. If you use Bash or if you use WSL2 on Windows or you're using Linux, uh, you might have to update this path accordingly. So just be aware of that. And then of course, I also run a little bit of cleanup so you don't have random tarballs sitting on your system. So once you run that, I've already run it on my machine. We're going to go over into Visual Studio Code itself, where I have, these are my demo commands. And by the way, you can see the demo commands also are directly from GitHub, so directly from the README. Um, let me go here. You can see here the demo notes, but the tutorial guide is a little bit more organized and actually has a full walkthrough. Uh, and I do recommend going through the tutorial guide, but the demo commands is just a simplified version. So the first thing you're going to have to do is going to be to add that stable repo. So for example, if I go over here, I'm using, I'm not even touching a cloud. I'm just using Docker for desktop, uh, which I have a Kubernetes cluster installed right here. And we'll take a look at how that's set up. Again, if you're new, I'm just using Kubernetes and I've clicked enable Kubernetes. That's really it. So if I do H3 uh, repo list, you're going to see I don't have any repositories which meant if I ran any of these commands, for example, we'll go ahead and just copy this right now. Oops, it's gonna, okay. We're copying this and go back over and I'm gonna paste that in. I'm gonna get an error because I don't have anything, right? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add the stable repo and hit enter. And then it's gonna tell me that the repo is successfully added. So now if I do H3 repo list, now I see my stable repo. So now if I actually say upgrade Nginx stable Nginx for my chart, now it's gonna say, okay, I can go ahead and install it. So that's gonna be one of the key changes. If I wanted to add incubator, I do incubator just the same way. So I hit enter and it says incubator has now been added. So if I do repo list again, now I see incubator. So we understand that the repo commands, everything works the same. The next thing I want to do is actually add the Jetstack repo because I want to install Cert Manager. Now I know I'm testing this locally. Uh, I've already done this and set this up on a AKS cluster that we'll use in a bit, but I want to show you how all the commands you're used to using still work just the same way. All the major charts still work just the same way. One of the big things with this Jetstack chart is I have to install this uh, Cert Manager into the Kube system namespace. So now I'm going to install using Helm 3, the cert manager. Let me make sure that I did that right. I'm gonna Hi, go. Jessica. I just had a request if you could zoom in on your screen a little bit. 
Sure. Make it a little larger. Thank you. All right. Hopefully, I do have it quite big, but hopefully that makes it a little bit easier. Let me go ahead and zoom in here too. So you can see we're going to run this command right here, just to highlight again, uh, dash n kube system. So now I'm going to go ahead and paste it in and install cert manager to kube system. Now you can see that I'm using the default namespace. Uh, you, I don't know if Zoom is actually working on Zoom, huh? but I did just zoom in here also so you can see I'm running anything against the default namespace. So I'm manually specifying the namespace I want to deploy to. Now if I do an H3LS or a Helm list, I'm going to see only one chart, but I just deployed two. Remember, releases are now scoped per namespace. So if I want to see that, I now have to do H3LS all namespaces, and now I can see here's Cert Manager, here's Nginx, here's Cube System, here's Default. Now we also talked about how you'll see uh, release markers now are stored in secrets. So if I do K get secrets and hit enter, now you'll see the release markers are Nginx ingress dot V1. We'll make that look a little bit more impressive when we start actually playing with full blown releases. So we scroll down. We can also, we've, we've kind of played with um, Helm LS and Helm namespaces, but I do want to show you I have Helm actually installed on the system. So if I type in Helm version, for one, I'm going to get Helm version. I have on my Kubernetes cluster and Docker, I have Helm 2 and Tiller deployed, but I also have Helm 3 version. So I'm using the same cluster with two different versions of Helm. If I do Helm LS, uh, I have a chart that I deployed yesterday. So I can still use this interchangeably, right? Now let's go ahead and kind of move on to some plugins. Uh, you can use the Kube Validator plugin, which is one that's kind of cool. This way it'll allow me to validate my charts. So if I want to go ahead and add this plugin, my plugin already exists. If you copy and paste it, it probably doesn't. If I CD over to my charts directory, I can go ahead and use H3 uh, kubeval, and that should be as long as I specify this, you'll see I'm, I'm using kubeval to, to validate my uh, values for this chart. Now, stable Nginx ingress, I want to set the replica count to a string value of 25, but it's going to If I hit enter, and we'll let it go ahead and try to run through that that running, you're going to see right here, I get an error. So we know that the plugin works. This was a plugin that was written for Helm 2 that still works just the same with Helm 3. You can see any of the XDG cache information. I'll let you play with that on your own system. We can also set up uh, a Jenkins server if you wanted to play with that. That's another really common chart. I can specify the namespace and deploy that. So we'll go ahead and do H3 upgrade and we'll go find Jenkins in my history, which it looks like I don't have in the history and I haven't specified a namespace. So I'll run this real quick and we'll go back up here. I like using um, val variables so I can reuse all of my commands. So I'll just scroll down, we'll paste in the namespace. And we'll go back up and say, okay, that should work, but I'm not in the right directory. So you wanna make sure that you're in the Helm 3 demo directory. Try this one more time. And I give you the, the YAML file. And I did this intentionally because this is another chart that was and a values file that was written for Helm 2. So you can use, use things for Helm 2 and Helm 3 completely interchangeably. Now, the last thing I really want to show you is about, and there's, there's a few things before I get into the DevOps piece. I just want to show you how these things work just the same way. I want to show you the conversion, where you convert an existing release from Helm 2 uh, over into Helm 3. So to do that, I'm gonna to switch to a cluster that I have. And by the way, my lights like to go off because motion doesn't work. Um, so I have, a cl I have a cluster that has Helm 2 installed. In fact, it's an older version of Helm 2. It's 2.14. We can see that right here. And if I do Helm LS using Helm 2, I'm gonna see quite a few different releases. One of them I'm gonna see is Croc Hunter right here. It has 21 revisions, and the last time I touched it was Tuesday, May 21st, right? It's an old release. If I do kget config map, and I 
everything is stored in the cube system namespace and config maps, you're going to see all of my releases for everything, right? This is a very active Helm 2 cluster with quite a different release, quite a few different releases and quite a few different release markers. Here's all of the Croc Hunter V1 all the way up to V21. They're not in numeric order, but we're going to go ahead and use the Helm 2 to 3, which I already installed right here. We just ran this command to get it. I'm going to use that to actually test this conversion. And before I do, I want to do secrets so you can see that I don't have any secrets right now, right? Which means I don't have any releases for Helm 3 right now. So I'm going to paste the dry run command initially just to make sure that it's going to tell me here's everything that's going to be created. It's going to recreate all of these releases. In fact, if I do an H3 LS and I'm going to do all namespaces, you're going to see I have a code fresh. I have two different code fresh releases. That's what we're going to go to in a second. But I don't have anything that just says Croc Hunter itself, which is the name of the previous release. So now I'm going to do the same command, but we're going to go back and remove dry run. Remember I said to always test dry run first. Now I'm just going to say convert Croc Hunter. And you'll notice I'm using Helm. This is a plugin you install to Helm 2 because you're using it from Helm 2 to Helm 3. So now it says that the release was created successfully. The V2 releases still remain, but after you test everything, it should be removed so you don't have to have any kind of migration history conflict. So now if I do the same H3 LS all namespaces command, you're gonna see I now have a third release, Croc Hunter revision 21, and it even kept the date and timestamp. It tells me the last time I updated it was May 21st. Now if I do a K get secrets in that namespace, you'll see anything that was previously in config maps in my kube system namespace. Now I have it isolated to the namespace in which the release was. So that was one of those big changes. Now let's go switch over and we're gonna talk about, um, and I wanna have this kind of go away. I have my little zoom thing that kind of dropped down. So let me make sure that this minimizes or I'll just drop this down for me. Now I wanna make sure that we go over to CodeFresh itself. CodeFresh natively supports uh, beta, I should say beta support for Helm 3, Helm 3 itself. They have a Helm 3 tag and we'll zoom in here so you can see, but they have a, a Helm step that you can use within CodeFresh uh, and they have a beta 3 tag that was just pushed eight hours ago where you can use Helm 3 as part of your pipeline. You can also do that in something like but there's a difference. One, because I can't securely pass in my context or my config now, and I have to make sure that my build server has that in a secure manner, Jenkins makes it hard for me to actually deploy or handle the CD part of my deployment. In fact, this was the Jenkins server that I set up. And if I wanted to get started with Helm, I, I wrote you an install script that would be able to handle that. We're gonna go and, and show you this command. Let me make sure that I switch over to the right cluster. I have a JDK, it's three cluster that has this Helm 3 Jenkins chart installed. But not only is this really slow, we'll let it build in the background here, it's, it doesn't actually deploy anything. Using CodeFresh, I can deploy everything natively because CodeFresh allows me to easily set up OAuth. So I'm gonna get this set up real quick. You can do this too, I include the same exact, you can fork this repo and I include the same exact um, pipeline in here. So we're gonna do Croc Hunter and I'm gonna hit create. And just like that, it's gonna go off and start building. I'm gonna stop all of these other branches and Helm Summit is gonna build. So we'll flip back to this tab and see exactly what happened. Now in CodeFresh, you'll notice I have everything nice and neatly laid out. I have main, I have building Docker image, I'm promoting to a private registry, I'm packaging it up, I'm doing Helm Lint, and I'm deploying over with, Hel with Helm itself. And if we notice, it pulled the image for Helm 3. But I set up the authentication to my cluster using built-in Kubernetes uh, support. So I have Azure AKS, I can add any kind of provider. I can do a custom provider, I can do Amazon, I can do Google, I can do EKS, DigitalOcean, IBM Cloud, truly you name it. And it sets up that I have access to JDK8-US. So now when I go back over into my actual projects and I click on, let's say, Croc Hunter, and we take a look at the pipeline, all I'm defining is deploy with Helm, and here's my steps. If we zoom in here, 
Anything where you see custom is where I'm pushing in the dash dash set to override my values. You can see that I'm using Helm 3, but I was using 214. I did not have to change anything in this pipeline with the exception of this line to make it Helm 3 ready. And CodeFresh right now, as far as I know, is the only one that makes it this simple where it's one line of change. Uh, like I said, we'll go take a look at Jenkins, but it doesn't actually deploy. This step wouldn't work. One of the ways that it's working for this particular step is I'm using values over here where I specify my Kubernetes context is that JDK8-US at JSD. And that was set up by the native support and integration between CodeFresh and Azure. So all I had to do from there is specify the location of my chart path, the namespace I wanted it to go into, uh, the release namespace, which probably is redundant, but I think I put it there twice. And then my repository email, my username, my password. I did that partially because this particular chart will dynamically create an image pull secret for me. But all I have to do is set any variables that then I'm referencing over here, which is the same exact setup I have in, if we go back over here, OSCON 2018. This was a release I did um, for Helm 2. And if we scroll down, and I'm gonna zoom in here real quick. You can see how old this is. It's using uh, Helm 2.9, but the environment variables are the exact same. The values are the exact same, which means that, and I, over here, you can also set shared secrets. So all of my secrets, I have a window of my video covering over this, so now we can see this. All my secrets are the exact same, even down to the Kubernetes context. So the nice thing about between Helm 2 and Helm 3 is, again, you can have seamless change once you know the little tiny differences and variables. Just to show you, because I show you we'd flip back over here, uh, it looks like Helm package didn't even work. That's wonderful. So I will fix that. But the beautiful thing is CodeFresh does. So we'll go back over here and you can see the previous build. Go into builds here uh, and we'll go into this one, which was the one I built now two hours ago, right before. And again, the deployment to Helm. And we can see, since everyone's wondering what Croc Hunter is, here is the release. It's the Helm Summit Edition. And if anyone wants to know what you do, you hunt crocodiles and you use the beautiful and easy part of Helm Free to do it. Just don't get hit by the crocodile itself. So the last thing we're gonna do is kind of wrap up and make sure we have time for questions. So let me switch back over to Kino and we're gonna hit play. Now, you might be wondering what's next. that any we're used to using, the ability to add repos, the ability to use plugins, the ability to use plugins that were specifically written for Helm 2 prior to Helm 3 ever becoming a thing. Same thing with charts. All of that works the exact same way. So what's next on the agenda? For one, we've already accomplished quite a bit in our Helm releases. So Alpha 1 was originally released uh, back with KubeCon Barcelona. Uh, it was the first iteration. It was tillerless. We had basic support for library charts, secret storage. So now you can also, since your releases and everything get stored as a secret, you can also use a custom secret provider like Key Vault or I think Google calls theirs key, key management, but you can use that as well. Uh, and then OCI charts. Alpha 2 focused on additional support for OCI packaging. We made some changes to how Helm installs, dependency management for dependency updates. Beta 1 first introduced uh, merge upgrades, and then we kind of made that more standardized XDG directory specification. We also started adding support for feature gates. Beta 2 was bug fixes for making error messages a little bit more readable, some CLI changes, and some config directory changes. Now, the cool thing about the beta 2 release is from what I've heard from the team is all of those commits were community commits. They were not from the core maintainer team. And I think that really just says how powerful this community driven project and based on community best practices truly is. And then finally, beta three has bug fixes now also for XDG since that was a new change for how stuff is stored, uh, how stuff is cached, the help text to make it a little bit more clear. Uh, so moving forward, it's really just going to be a lot of fixes. Uh, in fact, we'll talk just briefly about that. I have a, a link that I want to show you. But if you want to get involved, please go check out our docs. Our docs are also open sourced. So even if you don't program and go or don't know how to contribute from a technical level, but you still want to be a contributor, 
you can contribute to our documentation. If you're reading something that doesn't make sense or you think should be clarified, please go add that and submit a pull request to the docs itself. The docs have been used, moved to helm dub. You can also check out helm.sh for our community calls where you can stay up to date. Perhaps one of the biggest things that'll help us is feedback. Give us feedback on the latest beta release. If there's something that doesn't work, that isn't backwards compatible, we want to know because we really tried to make sure that the plugins, the charts, everything that you were used to doing should be backwards compatible. Uh, finally, I am Jessica Dean. If you have no idea who I am, if you follow me online, you might see ridiculous posts like this in addition to code. Uh, I do like fitness, I do like Star Wars, I do like Disneyland, and as you can tell from the picture to the right, I like just having fun. So in engaging with all of you wonderful engineers truly is fun for me. So you can go learn more uh, at these particular links. Like I said, I do have the Helm 3 data code. If you wanna learn more about OCI registries, I will definitely link you over with Josh Delinsky. You can also learn about multi-OS support with Helm by checking, off, uh, by checking out Ralph Squalachi at github.com Squalachi. Ralph Squalachi is the program manager for AKS uh, and he has a really great resource for Helm Multinode. And then that is a thank you. But I did promise you, I'll, I'll leave this slide up, but I did promise you there's one thing I wanna show you. If you're curious about what changes might not work, uh, the answer to that can be found in this particular link, which I got to from the release notes. In fact, I think I have the release notes still up. Nope, that was something I pasted. So this is a thing that right now is still being actively worked on uh, with Helm 3 itself. And most of it revolves around CRDs. So I would challenge you, if you are using CRDs, if you are using charts in production, uh, please check the, check the notes here, which again, you can get to from release notes. And I'll have a link to this in my readme within the next 30 minutes. So I'll make sure it's on the root of this. I'll put a link to that same current things being worked on. You can see all of that in action. So uh, I know we have just a few minutes. Hopefully we can, we can still have some time for some q and I'll leave this slide up real quick. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jessica. And actually, since we are getting towards the top of the hour, I'm just going to go ahead and launch a poll real quickly. Just let us know what you thought of the webinar and if you want to give CodeFresh a try while we answer um, our questions. So we have Dan Garfield on the line as well, um, our Chief hey. Technology Evangelist. But I think a lot of these will be um, directed towards Jessica here. So let's see. From Raj, we have, how does Helm compare with Kubernetes operators? So Helm itself, you can write your own. Actually, Dan and I were just talking about this the other day. I almost feel like I want to let Dan answer. Um, Dan, would you like to? You've been on the webinar, and I've been talking. Well, so, so um, with, uh, with Helm 2, Tiller really was essentially a Kubernetes operator. Um, now, with Helm 3, that model is actually going away. And so the reasons that you would want to use an operator, like if you want to have a specific uh, creation sequence or takedown sequence for like a SQL instance or something uh, are still going to exist. And basically Helm is uh, essentially stepping out of its operator role, I think in Helm 3. Um, would you agree with that, Jessica? Yes, I would. Um, I think Helm itself, especially in Helm 3, since it is more native um, and it uses anything that's defined for by Kubernetes, you kind of remove the need for having another operator that you're having to manage. Um, I think the more complexity you throw in, like the more operators, the more, I would even argue sometimes CRDs, um, not everything needs to be a CRD. I, I'm, I swear, I'm just trying to make the light go back on. Um, that's really the, the same thing to kind of be aware of with operators. I think Helm is now probably the most secure way to manage your Kubernetes deployments and you don't have to worry about an operator either of your own or of Tiller itself. Yeah, operators are uh, like CRDs, somewhat abused <laughs> today. Yeah, they probably do more than they should. But that, uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, let's see. I'll just move down the line here. Uh, Raj was asking when Helm three is going to be GA. That's the million dollar question right there. Yeah, that is the million dollar question. So luckily, that answer is above my pay grade. However, um, they're pushing for GA by the end of the year moving forward in between now and GA is really going to be bug fixes. So a lot of when it's going to go GA is going to be based on community feedback, what doesn't work, when that gets fixed, um, any additional 
patches that need to be released, but GA is not coming anytime within the next, I would say, one or two months, but they are shooting for it, I think, by the end of the year was what I've been told. Um, as far as, so I answered that live, so I'll click that. If I start to use Helm today, would you recommend just to start with Helm V3? So I get asked that question a lot. You have to remember Helm 3 is still in beta. There's going to be different changes that you kind of have to consider when it comes down to how you apply it to your pipeline. Uh, and some of those changes are going to be that you, it's assuming some sort of fam familiarity with how Helm 2 worked. I would recommend still making sure that anything you have, any older charts maybe, or um, anything that you were previously in development still works maybe with Helm 2, but you can move forward to Helm 3. I personally like always knowing a foundation, uh, especially since Helm 2 is stable, right? That is a public GA release. But Helm 3, I do think you should kind of become aware of it and you should start playing with it and making sure you have seamlessness. So I wouldn't say just outroll, uh, or out, out rule Helm 2 entirely, but I would say be aware of both and anything you use for Helm 2 should work the same with Helm 3. So it should make that transition incredibly smooth when you get there. Yeah, and I, I would add if, if your plan is to be in production next week, certainly <laughs> don't start with Helm 3, right? Start yeah. with Helm 2. That's, that's pretty well battle tested. All of the, everything's known at this point with Helm 2. Uh, but if you're not gonna be in production until like January next year, then eh, maybe you wanna get a head start. It's probably fine, but, but yeah. Uh, Helm 2 is still is still the current. I think it's really more of the Helm start. Like, yeah, I think this like playing with Helm 3 and beta is really it's it's getting that head start. It's making sure that you're kind of doing a POC for anything you already have running in production. So when it is GA, you can have seamless. Uh, it's not really failover, but a seamless uh, rollout or upgrade to something new. Um, uh, good, good answer. Um, next question is, uh, can you speak a little bit about the process of moving from Helm 2 to Helm 3? Do I need to remove Tiller? Uh, what's that look like? Is, uh, I believe there's actually a document for this. Uh, yeah, there's a command you can up. do that'll fully remove Helm and uninstall Tiller. Um, all Tiller is, is a deployment. So you can you can delete the deployment, you can delete the secrets, you can do a lot of things manually, or I think there is a Helm command. I can't remember it off the top of my head. Uh, but we can find a document for that and, and tweet that out. Yeah, it was just added uh, like seven hours ago to the, uh, okay. to the repo, so. Cool. <laughs> It's actually still open. The, uh, it, the pull request hasn't been accepted yet. So I'll put that in the chat if, uh, if anybody wants to follow along with that, uh, you're welcome to. Um, let's see, and the next question was, uh, could you speak a little about what changes, if any, have been made to the chart templating process, specifically how the values YAML does substitution for the chart? So the values YAML still works the same way. It renders the charts and it now uses the Kubernetes API directly. Um, the biggest change, and I actually, since my screen is still being shared, um, is now that you have to specify API version. So here's, this is under the Helm Summit branch for Croc Hunter. And if I look at chart YAML and I zoom in, you'll see I'm now specifying API version V1. If I don't have this line and I try to use Helm 3 to lint my chart, I'll get an error. If I use regular Helm, I won't, um, but now I have to be explicit in API version. That's one of the biggest changes. The other change is the addition of the CRD folder, um, but there wasn't any kind of changes as far as I know of about values and substitution. That's still gonna work the same way. Uh, previously, the way that you had everything kind of get rendered was Tiller was the mediator between your Kubernetes API and Helm itself. And so it would use a gRPC call to kind of handle that data back and forth. And now Helm can just communicate directly with the API. So that was the only difference as far as communication, but the rendering of templates still is the same. Uh, you do, however, now have some extra options, right? I mean, with Lua, you can, uh, you could potentially do um, some more. So Lua support is not a part of Helm 3 at this time and uh, it is not on the roadmap for GA at this time. Oh, they removed that from the, uh, 
from their plan. So that was never a part of the alpha release. That was a part of the roadmap. Um, but in the best interest of the Helm 3 community, uh, Lua is not uh, on the roadmap for GA, but it is still a consideration for future. But as of right now, you, uh, Lua is not part of Helm 3. Well, it's a good thing you're here because I would have just been giving people wrong information. Um... <laughs> Uh, and I, that's partly how come I didn't, even in the slides, there was no mention of Lua. Um, I, I, I'll answer that question more than happily when it gets announced, but there was a, a lot of um, consideration around that. And again, we really wanted to focus on key parts for Helm 3 and uh, GA. And a lot of that was focusing on the removal of tiller, security, um, OCI chart support, so while that's not completely off the roadmap, it's just not planned for GA at this time. Yeah. Good. Uh, um, we're going to do, I think, three more questions and we'll wrap it up. I know we're a little bit over time. Is that all right? That's fine with me, yes. Uh, what was the reason behind making releases a part of Kubernetes secrets? They're more secure. So I can actually encrypt my secrets, um, especially if I use a secret provider. Before, having it in config map and having it um, as part of Kube system, and it was just, I mean, pretty much it was a free-for-all. That wasn't the best way to handle security, uh, especially if your templates and your charts and your values has secret information. I don't want that rendered in something that's visible. Uh, using a secret object means that I can also back that by a secret provider, which gives me greater security, which was one of the primary objectives. Yeah, great, great, uh, great answer. I agree completely. Um, uh, last two questions. Is in cluster, everything stored, I. E. Yeah. Oh, is everything stored in cluster? I.e., if I upgrade something, go offline. Can the on-call guy roll back if he only has the same kubectl access as me, or does he also need access to all the Helm repo? So, if you're well, so hold on. This is a two-part question. Number one, are you telling me that your uh, on-call guy is going to be making a change outside of a DevOps pipeline? In which case, I do not advocate that at all. Um, <laughs> so, the answer to that should be that the on-call guy has access to your CI/CD server and is making changes, but not making manual changes on any kind of production cluster. However, uh, yes, the upgrade history is stored in the cluster in that secret object. So if you're doing a Helm rollback command, they're gonna have, Helm is gonna have whatever access the kube config has. Um, you shouldn't necessarily need access to the same repo because it's just stored in that release history. But I wanna preface that second part of the answer with do not do anything manually ever in production. You should always be going through a git commit, a git push, a CI CD pipeline, there shouldn't be any manual clicking of any kind. In fact, my personal hashtag is no clicky clicky. <laughs> Very good. Um, uh, and then fin our final question here as we end uh, is going to be, most of our use case for Helm is templating apps that don't need packaging for distribution. Is there a simpler way to use Helm without writing charts, a chart repo or a chart YAML? Um, so maybe I would actually need to have a little bit more clarification from the purpose of the question. Uh, Helm itself is powered by a template engine and the purpose was to make applying Kubernetes manifest files or declarative um, Kubernetes manifest easier, uh, which that's partly why uh, you have a Helm chart. Now that doesn't mean you have to do a package. I don't have to package everything up to simply share. But the purpose of Helm itself is to make your Kubernetes deployments and management of applications simpler and more secure. So you still would need a chart. That's the purpose of Helm. That's how Helm works. And it's a collection of templates. Um, so you would still have a YAML file and you would still have a values YAML and you still have your, your templates, your individual templates itself. Whether or not you need a chart repo is I guess kind of up to you. I like to think that chart repos are important because they kind of are like Docker repos where I can uh, version control my images and I can have markers where I can go back to things. But you can also just as easily package up your, your or you can just actually check your, your chart folder, uh, your collection of charts into your GitHub repo and specify the local path when you're running a Helm upgrade or Helm install command. Uh, hopefully I answered that question correctly. Yeah. If there was a, yeah, I, 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 don't add, know if I think, 
I think, yeah, the only part of this that you don't need is the chart repository because the whole purpose of that is really to make an artifact that's shareable and reconsumable. Um, if your chart lives in a Git repo and you go back and do a revert or, or pull in something from 10 revisions ago, you're going to get that version of the chart. Um, so since you're not bundling it up to share it or anything, you actually don't need to ever push it to a chart repository if you only use it for templating and you don't care about sharing it and for distribution. So the only thing that I do think is valuable mm -hmm. when it comes to a chart repo is I can still kind of, again, marker it and store it. So when I store images, I give the image name and the git commit ID, and that makes it easy for me to go back rather than having to go search in my, um, uh, I guess, git commit history and try to sit there and, and delineate out. But that, I, again, that's Dan's right. You don't absolutely need it. I personally like it just from a, a I like to keep all information, but um, yeah, that's the answer for that. Yeah, very good. All right. Well, well that we, uh, we got through all the questions. So big thanks to Jessica. Also, I would encourage you to just follow us on Twitter uh, at CodeFresh. Um, also, Jessica Dean is at JL Dean. Uh, and those are, that's another place where you're going to be able to see this stuff uh, in retro. So Thanks everyone for joining and have a fantastic weekend. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you. Thanks everyone.